move on, let's say, all right, we've got the elevated PSA, we went for a biopsy, now I've been diagnosed with a prostate cancer. Now what I think most men and most people here in the audience are interested in hearing is, all right, now what do I do? Do I do surgery? Do I choose radiation? Where do I go from here? Let's talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons, say, of surgery. It used to be it was recommended that that, that was thought of more for younger men and disease confined to the prostate, right? That yeah. stayed within the gland. Is that still the sort of the first line Not of really. screening? We've, um, we've, we certainly reserve surgery for men that have about a 10-year life expectancy at least. Mm -hmm. um, men with a less than 10-year life expectancy um, can probably be treated in other ways that are much less difficult to go through. Um, surgery obviously is an assault. It basically is a, an operation that one has to go through. There's a hospital stay, there's catheters. There's a lot to go through with an operation that if a man doesn't have a reasonable life expectancy, it's probably not worth doing it the hard way. Um, that's not always true for you know, the individual patient, but uh, most men that have a 10-year or less life expectancy will be treated with some other modality. Now, a 10-year life expectancy these days is about age 75. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not as if there should be an age cutoff per se, and as uh, Dr. Morris I think alluded to, it's, it's more of an assessment of life expectancy rather than, oh, he's 68, he should have this, or, you know, there's some 68-year-olds that run marathons and look great. They're healthier than I am. That's probably not a compliment, but, uh, um, you know, they're going to live for 20 years. There's some 50-year-olds that have diabetes, have hypertension that they don't want to treat. They've already had their first heart attack. They're not suitable for an operation. They're just an anesthetic risk. So again, it's, we've talked about individualized care and risk assessment. Um, you, you need to manage those accordingly, and it's, mm -hmm. it's not just age. So for, for surgery, basically you need a patient who's reasonably healthy, has a reasonable life expectancy, and once you discuss the pros and cons of surgery, um, that's what they'll lean themselves towards. And it really is what they decide. And what I tell patients, I could have your twin sitting next to you. You might decide on radiation. He might decide on uh, surgery. And you're both right. Um, it, that's how close it is. So what are the advantages of surgery? To get your question, well, I'd like I to talk. No, we'll get back. But no, go ahead. It used to be that, I mean, we said that surgery was really only for cancer that was confined to the gland. Is that still the case? No. Um, I think there's, we're learning more about what surgery can and can't do. So I think uh, one of the impressions is that if the cancer is microscopically gotten outside of the prostate, that that is no longer surgically curable. That's not true. Um, the majority of men that have microscopic disease outside of their prostate um, still do very well with just surgery alone. Sometimes they do need additional treatments. Um, and Dr. Zalewski will probably address that when we talk about, um, you know, combining modes of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're learning that we have probably underutilized surgery in higher risk men. And what has happened is the definition of higher risk or the types of patients that are considered higher risk has changed. So high risk 10 years ago used to be big bulky cancers. We didn't do very well removing big bulky cancers because it's very difficult because you're then having to think about removing the bladder or top of the rectum. It's just too much surgery. Um, the quality of life of the patient suffers dramatically. Nowadays, high-risk patients are primarily determined by biopsy Gleason score. So somebody will have a Gleason score that's 8, 9, or 10, but have a PSA that's under 10, have a relatively unremarkable digital rectal examination, we know they're higher risk based on the Gleason, but they're a completely appropriate surgical candidate. So again, the spectrum of the disease changes. That's what PSA has done. Um, it's really changed when we find patients. Before we get into some of the pros and cons of that, Dr. Morris, can you tell us a little bit Gleason score? We always hear that, but I'm not sure everybody knows exactly what that is. How do you sure. arrive at a Gleason score? So Douglas Gleason was a pathologist who noted that as he was looking under the microscope at prostate biopsies, that the appearance of the prostate cells under the microscope was very variable from one patient to the other. And basically, 
The challenge was to associate what he was seeing under the microscope with what his colleagues who were seeing the patients, what they were experiencing. And he found that simply by eyeballing the slide, not, not a fancy test really, just these organs and this one, just by looking at the organization of the cells, he could predict who would uh, relapse, who would develop metastatic disease, and who would ultimately die of disease. And despite all of the technological advances that we've made since that original observation of being able to look at DNA and being able to look at all sorts of pathways, so far nothing has trumped looking at the cells under the microscope. It's a remarkably simple thing, um, and yet nothing in, 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 since that's been developed since in terms of diagnostics has been able to prognosticate better than Gleason's score. Now, Gleason was able to capture the diversity of what he was seeing on that slide by creating his score, which is comprised of two values. Frequently, you'll, you'll hear Gleason 8 but what, or Gleason 7, but what you're really doing is using a shorthand there of adding two separate numbers. Prostate cancer isn't a single disease, even in a single patient. It is really a family of diseases that are growing in the same gland. So even in a single biopsy, you'll see a spectrum of aggressiveness. And the first number of the Gleason score is the aggressiveness of the majority of those cells, the, ma the major population. The second number is the aggressiveness of the minor population. And sometimes you even see a tertiary population. Hmm. And the score is the sum of those two scores. So really you're adding two separate scores of one to five, one being the least aggressive, five being the most. So if you have a 10, which is 5 plus 5, it means it's uniformly aggressive. Mm -hmm. If you have a 7, you could have some aggressive disease, let's say a 4, plus a lesser aggressive disease, let's say a 3. Mm -hmm. And the Gleason score, as a rule now, 8s, 9s, and 10s represent the most aggressive prostate cancers as a class, 7s somewhere in between, and 6s and below are the most favorable. I think one thing to point yes. out as well is that, as Dr. Morris mentions correctly, it is a subjective assessment. Mm -hmm. And so it's not infrequent where one institution has looked at the slides and under the microscope the pathologist thinks that this is a Gleason score of seven, intermediate risk. And, and there are other situations where that uh, another institution would call it a, a more uh, aggressive type. And I think patients need to understand it, that there is a subjectivity here uh, that they have to keep in mind. It's, it's not black and white. And uh, keeping that in mind, I think, gives patients some reassurance that uh, while some may think of this as a very aggressive, an experienced pathologist may not think it's as aggressive as somebody else had thought. Although I would say, although it's subjective, it's pretty reproducible. So I guess the best analogy would be, um, an Olympic event where you have either a skater or a diver, you have an array of judges, and each of them is going to vary by a small amount, provided they're honest judges and, they, and they're experienced judges. But if you'll notice, the scores, although they vary, they really do pretty reproducibly distinguish the excellent skater from the mediocre, from the poor. The variance is pretty small. So, I think that experienced pathologists, though they may vary the score, uh, can generally reproducibly distinguish a very aggressive prostate cancer from an intermediate one from, from a good risk prostate cancer. And then there's a score from the Russian judge, which is always right, somewhere Right, which is the outlier. Yeah, some, right. The outlier. It's always out there somewhere else. <laughs> I apologize if we have uh, <laughs> yeah. any Russian judges in the audience. <laughs>